I speak to all of you in English today. Not because I speak in English, not because I think I sound good in English, because to my ears, and I'm just talking my ears, I'll never sound as good as I do in Hmong. But I speak today because I believe it is important for us to understand each other. I'm here to build a bridge of understanding. I don't care if you agree or disagree with my talk. The truth is that if I'm any good at all, when you walk out those exit doors, you will walk out with a little bit more understanding inside, and I will have succeeded. That's the standard that we're playing by. But my name is Ngo Kaldiaya, and I say I'm from the Hmong community. My mom and dad came from Thailand, the refugee camps of Thailand. I came when I was just six years old. When we came to America, I knew three three American things. Um, the teacher at Battle Creek Elementary School said, say your ABCs. I said, A, B, and C. <laughs> and she said, say your ABCs. And I said, A, B, and C. So I failed the test. My older sister, who was a year and nine months older than I, she said that every color was yellow and that every English word ended with an S. I thought she was the smartest person in the world. But we came when I was six. By the time I was seven, I was already learning uh, quite a bit of English. One day, the light bulbs in our house began flickering, and they went out. So my mom took me to Kmart to buy light bulbs. My mom was younger than I am now, and I thought she was an incredibly beautiful woman. After me, she had six miscarriages. Because in Bambi and refugee camp where I was born, Hmong people only got food three days out of the week. Because by the time I came along, Thailand was practicing a deterrence policy. Every time I looked at my mom, she would give me the food in her hands. So she did not have enough, enough food for her body. She didn't have enough food to carry life. So six miscarriages after me, and I was her baby. Every time she had a miscarriage, my, I would hear the voices of my aunts and my uncles say, she's dying, she's dying. But in the morning, my mother would get up with me. And so I grew to believe that my mother was the most powerful woman I knew, although she's not much taller than I am. And I think I kind of actually look very much like her. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm seven years old and we're at Kmart. And my mom walks up to the clerk because she's so brave. And she points to the ceiling because she doesn't have the one word for light bulb. She says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. My mother has an accent. The clerk listened for a little bit. And then she got impatient and she walked away. My mother stood there waiting for her in the fluorescent light. And then at some point she started looking at her feet. And I realized she was ashamed to be in front of me. I decided in that moment that if my mother, if the world did not need to hear my mother and my father, then surely they didn't need to hear me. So the next day I stopped talking in school. At first I felt like a rebellion. At first I felt like I was putting my foot down. But slowly my voice died in front of me. Because when the teacher said, no, Galia, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't say here. My voice sounded so rusty to my ears. It creaked. And other kids laughed and they looked. I began speaking three years ago with the publication of my book, The Late Homecomer. So you're meeting, you're meeting a new voice in the world, right? Three years ago, this book comes out and it is the first full-length literary work to be published by a home writer in America with national distribution. And I... I'm saying in this book that Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world, only the world didn't know it. I'm saying that two-thirds of the Hmong died so I could be here, a third with the Americans in the war, and another third in the genocide of the aftermath. And so many intelligent people were saying, if this was going on, then how come we didn't know about it? Because it was America's secret war in Laos. The CIA had commissioned 35,000 Hmong men and boys to fight and to die. And a lot of the fighters were 10, 11, and 12 by the end of the war. Little boys fighting for candy. Pockets full of candy. I travel all over the U.S. And, and every place I go, there's someone who comes up. And they say, I knew, but I didn't do anything. In Florida, a man came up and he said to me, you know, I was fighting with these boys, and they were 11 and they were 12. And I didn't know they were boys until the bombs started falling. And then they started crying for their mothers putting hands over faces, crying, and I realized they were children. He said, when we left, I don't know what happened to them. But one of them saved my life. And I hope he doesn't hate me wherever he is. But your coming here gives me hope. 
because it means in so many ways that he has a daughter who remembers his story. That is the kind of story I come from, and that is the voice that I give to English. When my book first came out, people said, who's going to read it? The Vietnam War was so unpopular. Outside of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and California, nobody knows who the Hmong are. Barnes and Noble and, and Borders didn't want to carry it in store because they said it wasn't commercial. But, but mostly women, men and women, but mostly women, book clubbers, went into the bookstores and they said, we're looking for this book, The Late Homecomer by Ngo Kaliaya. That's how my book made it to the shelves of Barnes and Nobles and Borders. In 2009, um, the, my book becomes the first book in Minnesota to have ever won two Minnesota Book Awards. Not only am I the first Hmong person or the youngest person to have ever won two Minnesota Book Awards, I'm the only one. And so we made history. And I go all over the country speaking to young people because I want you to understand that history is not the thing that makes us. We are the products of history. We create the history that we belong to. Growing up, my mom and my dad taught me. They said to me that they're uneducated people, that they have nothing to give to me in terms of knowledge. They said that it would be the men and the women of the classroom who would teach me where I belong in terms of a bigger history. They sent me to school. My book begins with an apograph, and I'm going to read it to you, and then I'll tell you why. So the book is written for Zhuo Li, my grandma, who never learned how to, how to write. And then it's also for Max Huo Hu Ya, my little brother, who will read the stories that my grandma has never written. And it begins with, with an apograph, and the apograph says, Before babies are born, they live in the sky where they fly among the clouds. The sky is a happy place, and calling babies down to earth is not an easy thing to do. From the sky, babies can see the course of human lives. This is what the Hmong children of my generation are told by our mothers and fathers, by our grandmothers and grandfathers. They teach us that we have chosen our lives, that the people who we would become, we had inside of us from the beginning, and the people whose worlds we share, whose memories we hold strong inside of us, we have always known, from the sky, I would come again. It begins this way because because I, I grew up poor in America. We grew up, um, I'm a kid from the projects of St. Paul. My mom and dad were able to buy a $35,000 house in 1996 that, that was 900 square feet in the east side of St. Paul, which is one of the most impoverished neighborhoods. And in this house, the 900 square feet, there was you know six kids and mom and dad, and we shared one bathroom, and the walls were all rotted with mold, and I was always, always sick, because no matter how much we wiped, no matter how many layers of paint, the mold never, the mold never stopped. It grew wild. I say like the dripping of tears. In this place where I was born, I'd never been to a movie theater. I was in high school and I'd never been to a movie theater and inter um, Leonardo DiCaprio's Titanic came out. So in a house without cable, we watch a lot of entertainment tonight, every night at 6.30, and there was a special on Leo. And like a lot of the young women in the nation, I was in love. You know, I knew that Leo was going to be my future husband. And that day, all of my peers, all of my friends said that they were going to go see a Titanic in the theaters, and I wanted to go. But I couldn't go because I had to come home to take care of the younger kids so my mom and dad could go to work. They're factory workers, they're assemblers, so they could go to work on the night shift. And I walked home and my bags, my book bag felt so heavy in my hand. So I walked right in front of my father. He was sitting on the sofa, tying his safety toe boots, getting ready to go to work. And I walked right in front of him and I, I dropped my book bag to the ground. And my father looked up. And I looked him in the eye and I said, this is not the life that I wanted. This is not the life that I chosen for me. And the house got really quiet, I noticed, because all the kids were looking at me, and they couldn't believe the words that had come out of my mouth. And my father looked at me, and for a moment I thought he was going to cry. And then he said, he said words I'll never forget. My father said, if I could choose, I would choose you all over again. And a long time ago, when you were up high in the clouds, when you were flying, you, when you could see the course of rivers and the trajectory of mountains, you saw a man and a woman walking without shoes in the jungle of Laos, and you chose to come down to them. My father said, life is not going to teach you the weakness of the human heart. It is going to teach you how strong that human heart can be. And I had no words. 
I watched my father got up and limped to the door to stand by a machine one more day so his supervisor can tell him, B, you're here to talk to machines, you're not here to talk to me. The greatest song poet I know. Many, many years later, I'm writing this book. I'm at Columbia University, one of the finest institutions in this country. Kids from the project do not dream of the Ivy Leagues of the bigger world. But there I was, and I said that I was going to become a writer. I belong to a community that believes we need doctors and lawyers. Doctors to heal what is broken in the human body, lawyers to protect the rights that we've never had enough of. I grew up believing that if you point to the moon, the moon is going to come and slice your ears. In the morning, I get up and there is blood on my ears. The moon really slices my ear. It really does in the night. Like how many of you in this room have, have ever been sliced by the moon? Because you're pointing. Look around you. It happens. A lot of us believe in the power of the moon. And so when we point, the moon comes and slices our ears. That is the reality that we belong to. There is blood on my hands and everybody can see. But nobody quite believes that the moon would do this to one little Asian girl, one little home girl, living in grave poverty. But there I was at Columbia, and I was writing this book, and I say that I'm going to become a writer for a people that needs one. Three, three years ago, I began speaking. I don't write a speech because I'm not interested in giving you some digest, some perfected version of myself. I want you to see the transparency of the human heart when it fights for what it believes in. When it fights to build a more understanding world, because I come from a mother and a father, aunts and uncles, grandparents who cannot tell their stories in English. So they live, they live hidden in, in, in misunderstanding. My father says to me, look up at the cloud sky today, today, the cloud flowers are blossoming. He doesn't just say it's a cloudy day. He says, look out at the garden of winter, the snow flowers are melting. My father says, the sky that I lived on fell on me and the earth that I walked on threw me off. Who would I be to stand in your way? A long time ago, he carried me and my sisters in his arms, and he climbed a tall tree because we couldn't leave the 400 acres that I was born on. 40 to 50,000 Hmong people in, on, on 400 acres. If you can imagine, that's less than a square mile in radius. Because he couldn't leave them, my father carried me to the tops of the trees. And he says, look out. Look at, out, look at the horizon. One day you will walk on the horizons your father has never seen. He held up my hand and he says, the size of your hand and your feet will not dictate your life journey. It is for that man that I, that I spoke three years ago and it is for him still that I speak. My father says that if long tears can reincarnate, then the world will reign in our sorrow. But because they cannot, they can only green the mountains of Pumbia. But my words, if I speak, if the winds of humanity blow, then our lives are not lost. That is why I speak. And I am coming from the Hmong story, but I'm here to remind all of you that it wasn't so many generations ago that your parents, your grandparents came from somewhere so you could call this place home. That the English we all speak were built on accents not so differently than my own. And that is why I believe. Because we are the happy endings that they've been waiting for. Somewhere in time, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, there's a man and a woman. And we were as far as they were ever going to get into the future. We were the happy endings that they've been waiting for. And that is the ending that I'm out to live. There is no reason why I shouldn't live my life as if it's my dream. The average human being only gets about 25,000 days. That is not so much. I'm not about going and passing by. I'm not here so you can see me for a little bit, sit patiently, and go and, and, and let the day continue as it has. I want to change the way you see the world. Whenever you hear Mong locally, yeah, whenever you think about the day, I want you to remember a little bit that that day is for creating memories. Because one day you'll become old, like my grandma was, the person who I wrote the book for. When your favorite foods and the people who loved you, they will become memories. When you're sitting by that window somewhere in time, it will be your memories that you speak to. And I want all of you to be so clear that you have to create the memories that you want to speak to. 25,000 days is not so, so much. It's not enough time to do good work. So that's what I do. That's what I'm here to do. And I'm here for all of you. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk to me, not because I have answers. I ask for questions only because I want to think out loud about what matters to you. That remains the only gift that human beings can give to each other. My daddy says that at the end of the road, all we have to give are our tears and our words. And I'm not here because I want to hold those back. 
So please talk to me. Okay? I'm here for you. I don't want this to be boring. If it is, then you Facebook me and you tell me. Okay? Because I'm, 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 I'm out to grow. I want to become a better speaker. I want to become a better writer. I want to become a better human being. I don't even have 25,000 days left. Maybe. Maybe 19,000. And I want to make them count. I'm out to create a memory with you. So talk to me. Okay? Talk. Raise your hand and talk.